Columbia and watch the kayaks negotiating the Fraser River. We join the group as they drive north to the source of the river at Yellowhead Pass, high in the Rockies. I have been for a long period among the Rocky Mountains, but have never seen anything to equal this country. I cannot find words to describe our situation at times. We had to pass where no human being should venture. Had we suddenly come upon a cascade, or bad rapid, not to mention waterfalls, it is more than likely that all of us would have perished. These were the words of Simon Fraser in 1808, which inspired us to follow his journey down the river named after him. We wanted to paddle the whole river, if at all feasible, to run all the rapids and waterfalls that Simon Fraser had thought impossible. This journey had never been attempted before. We would descend the river from close to its source in the Rocky Mountains, 800 miles to the Pacific Ocean at Vancouver. The most dangerous part of our journey would be the notorious Hell's Gate Canyon near the end of the river. Our start would be Yellowhead Pass, the same place that Simon Fraser had crossed the Rocky Mountains. Well, this is it, folks. Well, the idea of a self-sufficient wilderness trip is always attractive. But it's not until you actually set off that the realities hit home. Why don't bike? <laughs> I mean, to start with, everything has to go in your boat. Food, clothing, equipment. And nobody wants to paddle an overladen, unmanoeuvrable kayak on difficult rapids. But then on the other hand, you don't want to leave out extra warm clothing. A difficult compromise in freezing temperatures. And then once you've decided what to take, it all has to be thoroughly waterproofed. Chance of capsize on easy water may be a thousand to one, but you can't take the risk of a wet sleeping bag, or for that matter, the embarrassment of explaining why the evening meal has already been rehydrating for 12 hours. Only 800 miles to go. And it got particularly bad when we reached forest area where it was very swampy and horribly smelly in fact I really thought I was going to be sick at one point it was so smelly it was so shallow really and a lot of it uh, that it was almost better to push with your paddle off the sides of the bank of the stream rather than uh, than in the water itself Melting snow in the mountains made the water freezing cold during the early stages of our expedition. In fact, we were all surprised by the coldness of the water and air temperature. Huddled around the fire, we all secretly worried about whether the rapids to come were really as bad as we'd heard and whether we could survive a capsize in the freezing water. How much further is it to overland the falls, Pete? About a mile. The, the problem is it does a quick left down bend before the fall. And it goes straight down the fall, so if you miss the break out, you'll be over London's this. And what you'll have an interesting drop. Simon Fraser had used heavy Indian canoes during his exploration of the river and had had to carry them around many rapids like these. We were using modern kayaks made of the latest space-age plastics that were strong, light and instantly manoeuvrable. These special attributes were essential if we were to stand any chance of success. Whitewater rivers are graded on a scale of difficulty 1 to 6. We were now paddling grade 4 rapids. Testing but very enjoyable and a good warm-up for the more difficult and dangerous sections we knew were ahead.
Sue Hornby was the only woman in the team. This was her first expedition, but she was a superb all-round kayaker and Commonwealth Ladies Wild Water Champion. Overlander Falls looked terrifying, and it was only after much discussion that we decided to run it. He was trapped upside down against the rock. There was no way we could reach him. We felt helpless. He was washed clear and seemed okay. The rescue boats could now reach him. Pete was safe, but the paddles had been carried away by the current. We immediately started looking for them. To lose a paddle this early in the trip was serious. Close to our camp, we found traces of a gold mine. 50 years after Simon Fraser's exploratory journey, some of the richest gold fields in North America were discovered in the Fraser Valley, and people headed north in the scramble for easy pickings. Sue and Jeff hoped they'd find a few gold nuggets still lying around, but all that remained were some rusting relics. At the peak of the gold rush, up to $1,000 worth of gold were extracted from a single panful of gravel. By 1890, however, the fields had been stripped of their riches and most of the mines abandoned, leaving only a few old prospectors still working the area. Old-timer Wesley Morris told us many tales of the Fraser Valley. And five decades passed canoeing, backpacking and mountain climbing and all that stuff. Yeah. Amazing. At Lytton, when he pulled out there, yeah. there were 1,200 natives gathered around him. I guess he thought it's goodbye, Simon Fraser. <laughs> but they just wanted to talk. <laughs> well, 800 miles by kayak in only four weeks is a pretty daunting task by anybody's standards. And you know, especially as so far we've only done a few hundred miles. And really, the distance remaining just doesn't bear thinking about. But all you can do is take each day as it comes, knowing you've set yourself this task and that one way or another you've just got to do it. Oh yes, with a bit of help from the current and by paddling from dawn till dusk, you can make 40 miles a day. All right, that's on a good day. And yes, it is relatively easy to start with. 
but you know, after days on end, sitting for nine hours in wet clothes in a cramped kayak, it does become mentally and physically exhausting. At last, the luxury of an early camp. Something smells around here. Blimey, first priority has got to be to wash your one and only set of clothes. I must admit, at this stage, minor details like dirty clothes do rather get pushed to the back of your mind, when the few hours break from paddling gives you time to contemplate the Fraser Canyon ahead. This in many ways being the climax of the expedition. I mean, it's got to be the worst part of the river. Historically, it's claimed hundreds of lives, and the well-documented stories of 40-foot whirlpools, huge waves and dangerous turbulence, definitely not a place to swim. Thoughts of the next day made every member of the expedition apprehensive. The real dangerous thing about this rapid is that you've got no control over where you go or what happens to you. And if you were to do it, you'd be completely at the mercy of the river. It takes a lot of skill to go down the right line, the right place, at the right time and get it just right. But this one, no skills involved at all, apart from would be just to exist. It looks very dangerous. The water is very inconsistent and it's pretty mean. A rapid with a name like Hell's Gate has just got to be mean. The thought of boiling white water a hundred times the volume of the Thames was frightening. But looking at it, it didn't appear as dangerous as we had been led to believe. However, last year six people lost their lives on this rapid and we treated it with the utmost respect. Before our expedition, only one person had ever descended Hell's Gate by kayak, and Sue was the first woman ever to attempt it. I was very nervous when we got here and I looked at it, and I thought it looked difficult, and I was pretty scared, but when I decided I was going to shoot it, that was it, I felt quite calm, and it was a lot bigger than it looked, but and it's very turbulent, but it was okay, I survived. <laughs> the river was now out of the mountains, and we had only a hundred miles of flat water to the ocean. 
With the dangers behind us, we realised how tired we actually were. And we're really looking forward to a hot bath and the comforts of civilization. Personally, I was tired, but I knew the finish was near. I felt deeply satisfied to have paddled the whole river from source to mouth. On reflection, when I'd first set out, the thought of covering 800 miles of river through some of the most dangerous canyons in the world, well, it hardly seemed possible at the time. Now it's almost over. Of course, I've got a feeling of satisfaction. But I think also a feeling of intense relief that we've all come through it OK. We reached the sea at Vancouver and finished at English Bay, the same spot that Simon Fraser had landed in 1808.